10 eShop games worth buying. You clicked on the video, you know what this is. I dive into the eShop and I find 10 games that are actually worth the price, which is getting harder and harder to do. We've talked about it recently, but it's all what we like to call Luigi content and shovelware. But where are all the other AAA third party developers? Well, it's the indies. The indies are still supporting this console and putting some really great experiences on it. So let's show them some love. All right, with all that said, if you still like these videos, and oh boy, I've made a lot of them. This is episode 30 something. Make sure to like, comment, subscribe, share the video with a friend. Oh, and don't forget, you can still get the desk mat. I'll leave links in the description. Yeah, before I review these eShop games though, let me review this web browser because the one you're using is bad. Get a better one. This video is sponsored by Opera GX. Yeah, look, we're all gamers here and Opera GX is a web browser for us. I mean, quite literally, the browser has baked in indie games that you can play for free. There are so many fun, cool, and unique features in this browser. Like for example, it's completely customizable and moddable from themes to wallpapers, keyboard sound effects, and background music. I found a Sonic theme, a Pokemon Emerald theme, Mario, and even my favorite favorite Zelda. Not only is this Zelda background animated, but listen to the keyboard sound effects. It's so cool. Also, you can mix and match any of the themes and sound effects. Then you have this sidebar. There are so many things you can put in here. I added my messenger and Twitter so that I can just check my DMs on the fly. Also, adding Twitch to it was awesome. And then I also have ChatGBT in my sidebar because Opera GX has native integration with generative AI. So if I'm just browsing online and see something I want to fact check, I can just plug it in right there. I talked about playing games that are baked in here. That's part of GX Corner, which is basically their version of old school gaming magazine. At the top of GX Corner, you can see a calendar of upcoming games, even watch trailers for them, which is really handy. Then you have the games you can check out. I found a dungeon crawler called Tunnels of Doom that I just started playing instantly. And if you're worried about this browser slowing down your PC at all, don't worry, it's actually the opposite. By using the GX control tab, you can limit the amount of CPU and RAM the browser uses. I tested this and it was using a third of what Chrome uses. And Finally, it allowed me to import all of my other browser history, bookmarks, and cookies. It's even compatible with every single Google Chrome extension, and it did it all instantly. So if any of that sounds good to you, I don't know why it wouldn't, there's links down below. Grab Opera GX, it directly supports the channel, and it's free. Give it a shot. All right, back to the eShop. The first game I want to talk about today is called Arranger. Actually, the full title is Arranger, a role puzzling adventure. Bit of a mouthful. Every moment of this game, right from the very start, is a puzzle to solve. Even the way you traverse the world, your character technically never moves from the spot they're standing. Rather, you just take that spot with you until the end of the game. But every action has a reaction, because every time you move in a direction, everything in that column moves with you. So if you want to take your mother's fridge for a stroll outside, you'll finally have the perfect answer to the classic prank call. Is your fridge running? We're off to a great start. This world is yours to slide around with ease. If you want to create your own shortcut by sliding off screen and wrapping back around on the other side, you can. But once you get to the dungeons and the puzzles, you'll find locked objects that will prevent you from sliding certain tiles or columns. There'll be swords that you can't pick up, but you can use the world's sliding movement to push them into enemies, switches that need to be constantly pressed to open a door with feet for free, and so much more over the game's six-ish hour runtime. For this mechanic to not get old, the developers would have had to have filled the world with thoughtful, well-designed, fresh, non-repetitive puzzles, and that is exactly what they did. Every new challenge needs to be solved in a different way, either using techniques you learned earlier or by taking a whole new approach to sliding around the world. It's a fun and fresh idea that doesn't outstay its welcome. With a super charming art style from the same artist behind Braid, satisfying snap happy movement and just the right amount of story. This one is a perfect Switch puzzler for any puzzle fans that might be looking to be puzzled. <laughs> Didn't know how to end that. Thank goodness you're here is set in a bizarre town in Northern England and I'm now, you know what? I feel like these 10 lists, I put a lot of work into them, but I could go one step further. I I'll be right back. Thank goodness you're here. I was huh? gonna say, it's no green screen. 
not a green no, screen. See, green. yeah, There's see, no green. See, that's that. I'm, I can walk all the way back. You know what I mean? It's a full twenty dollars on the eShop, but only two hours long, and yet it's probably the best twenty dollars I've ever spent on the eShop. With standout animations, so many jokes and callback jokes, fantastic one-liners, easy to miss moments for a second playthrough, and at its core, just an entertaining point-and-click puzzle adventure. <laughs> Anyone got the time? Even though solving a lot of the puzzles in this game was satisfying and I enjoyed doing it, it was never about that for me. I just wanted to keep pushing along the narrative so I could see what laugh out loud Monty Python reminiscent moment was coming next. So while I was playing this game... Oh no, not the, not the King 2. <laughs> While I was playing all of these games on the eShop, you were sat with me playing Dreamlight Valley. Yeah. And the second I turned on, thank goodness you're here, she locked that switch, yeah. threw it away, yeah. and watched the whole two hours with me. We were glued oh, to it, laughing crazy. the whole yeah. way. It was good stuff, wasn't it? It was fun. In it. Developed by the creators of Untitled Goose Game, I'm actually surprised that more people aren't talking about this one. So this game, Kim, it's set in a bizarre town in Eastern London. Right? Eastern London? I thought you said Northern England. Northern... Sorry. <laughs> Where are we? Wait, you don't want to piss Northerners off, mate. Northern. Oh. It's set in a bizarre town in Northern England. And to get ahead of the comments, I realize I'm not in Northern England, but Northern England doesn't have the Big Ben. So, get a Big Ben, Northern England, and <laughs> I'll go over there. The humor is clever, absurd, and quick-witted. At times, incredibly crass and very inappropriate, but in the best way where maybe, I don't know, don't play it around kids. <laughs> Again, for me, it was the use of callback jokes that would send me laughing. Like the fishmonger, who you visit multiple times during the game, and each time you have the option of helping with his fish display by smacking all the fish in a position. This happens several times throughout the game, but it's the last time that I visited him and smacked all of his fish that something caught me very off guard. Yeah, look at that. The fishy foot. Not that one. Ooh, so that's what bangers and mash is. Huh. Anyway, Rusted Most might just be a quintessential example of what a hidden gem really is. Tight, responsive, and unique controls, fantastically animated, melaconic pixel art, and a wonderful world design. But what it doesn't have is anybody talking about it. Finding Rusted Moss buried down in the eShop between the sea of Luigi content and shovelware was the first time I'd ever heard of this game, which made me more and more upset as I played and enjoyed it. Rusted Moss is a twin stick shooter baked inside a Metroidvania where you use a grappling hook, physics, and a full 360 degree aiming system to traverse around. Starting with the grappling hook, this is such a fun mechanic that admittedly, took me quite a while to get used to. And I don't even mean mastering the physics of it all, just the fact that with it being a twin stick shooter, it means that the grappling hook buttons need to be placed on the controller's trigger buttons. It felt a bit unnatural at first, but because your thumbs always have to be on the sticks for the twin stick shooting, kinda has to be. You can't reach up for the buttons, you, you gotta use the triggers. So it did take some getting used to, but once I did, I had full control over my movement and mixing up the shooting, grappling, bouncing, falling, bungeeing, swinging, even grappling onto enemies for different effects. It became so fluid and fun. The game's pretty challenging. The enemies, the bosses, they'll wipe you out with ease if you're not careful. It's set up very similar to a Souls-like game with the rest points and the experience points that drop when you defeat enemies and you can use those to upgrade yourself. There's eight different weapon types to find, over 20 abilities, a bunch of bosses, multiple endings, characters to meet, lore to uncover throughout this gloomy, stylistic adventure. I really hope some of you check it out and give this game some love because I had you heard of it? Let me know below if you'd actually heard of this game and I mean no disrespect to the developers. I feel like more people should hear about this. I fell so deeply into Lorelei and the laser eyes. It made me feel on edge and concerned while playing. The same way that the first Resident Evil made me feel on GameCube all those years ago when I played it for the first time. That might have been in part influenced by the similar isometric-esque view, unnerving cryptic puzzles and sinister characters, but at least there's no tape controls. As the game loads up, it actually recommends to have a pen and paper on 
standby to take notes as you play, jotting down anything that seems to be of any kind of importance or relevance because chances are it might just be. You also need to have some basic understanding of math, so I was screwed. I'm usually not even into these kind of escape room style games where you need to use your brain to solve riddles and clues because again, I'm a YouTuber. Don't use my brain that often. <laughs> but there was a great mix of easy, medium, and I have no freaking clue riddles for me to get enough serotonin hits of feeling like the latest brilliant mastermind of our generation. It made it so I just wanted to keep pushing forward a little more to see if I could unlock one more door or piece together one more part of the puzzle. You play as a woman. <laughs> I don't think she has a name, who was invited to participate in a mysterious project set in an old mansion. As you explore, the whole situation becomes progressively more dangerous and completely surreal. The whole game is in black and white noir style, but the use of a bright red color is used to highlight clues, footprints, blood, and other unnerving elements around the mansion and its grounds. Yeah, be prepared to get frustrated. I mean, if this game wasn't cryptic and challenging, then it wouldn't be a riddle that's worth solving, but I found it completely engaging and one of the best games in its genre. Iona is a cozy game content creator. She is so bright and bubbly and full of personality. I love her so much. I have a hard time pronouncing her name and I call her Iwana and I prefer it that way. <laughs> I asked Iona if she'd like to cover one of the games in this video. I like to invite creators on every once in a while. So I'm gonna pass it on to Iwana who's gonna cover the next game. Oh, hi. Let's talk about Cat Quest 3. Now, if you know anything about me, you'll know that I am a sucker for anything to do with cats. And as soon as I heard that Cat Quest 3 will not only let you play as a cat, but as a cat pirate, I knew I immediately needed to check this game out. But just a word of warning before we get into this, this is gonna involve a lot of puns. I'm sorry. Cat Quest 3 will see you set sail on the Caribbean seas in search of treasure. But unfortunately, you're not alone in this search, as the seas are filled with pie rats who will do whatever it takes to reach that treasure before you do. But not only will you have to take on these pie rats when you're on the land, in a pretty fun combat system that will not only see you take on enemies with swords, but also with different spells that you pick up as you go along, but your battles will also take place on your very own ship as well. But the thing that really took me by surprise for Cat Quest 3 is just how much there is to do for the price. As not only is there the main story for you to do where you go off in search of this treasure, but also deal with some extra dimensional beings, but there's also an entire open world to explore as well. You have dungeons scattered around that are filled with treasure to plunder. There's also a ton of different side quests to do, and this can be anything from solving mini puzzles to even delivering mail to clams, and you can even fish as well. And all of this will not only help your character to level up, but you also get money that you can spend on upgrading your equipment and spells to help you out if you get stuck on boss battles. But don't worry if combat isn't really your thing. You can either do couch co-op and get a friend to come help you out with the battles, or you can just turn on the easy battle mode instead. And not only is this a great game for the price, this also runs surprisingly well on the Nintendo Switch, even the open world segments. So if you're interested, this is definitely worth checking out. Yeah, you know, I almost feel bad inviting Iwana to hang out in this video and then immediately me reviewing the cozy game in the video, since that's her whole thing. But it's my video and I wanted to talk about Moonstone Island. <laughs> also, I played Moonstone Island on my Steam Deck. I'm sure it's the same on Switch. It's also the only game in this video that I was given a code for. So thank you, Moonstone Island. <laughs> oh Lord, I had a lot of fun with this one and you Stardew vans are gonna love it. Also possibly Pokemon fans. Moonstone Island splices creature collecting with life sim, with open world, with crafting, with farming, and even sprinkles in a little bit of card based mechanics because I mean, what can't it do? My first first several hours with this game had me exploring over a hundred floating islands, taming and battling spirits, going on dates with an early love interest, and growing my first few crops right outside my hut that I accidentally placed on top of an ore mine. It's pretty overwhelming at first. Like several shops on the main island, dungeons to explore and collect loot, shrines and orbs to collect and interact with, brewing potions, fishing of course, leveling up with skill trees. It felt like there wasn't enough time in each 
day to do half of the stuff I wanted to do. And I'll admit that this game maybe tried to do a little bit too much, with some of its elements feeling a little underbaked as a result. But I think the sheer amount of stuff you can do makes up for any of that. You always have your main and side quest to follow, but the adventure is yours for the making. If you want to just sit on your farm and grow crops all day long, there's nothing stopping you. If you want to train up the most powerful spirits possible or collect them all, you can do that too. Visually, the game is popping with bright colors, a very similar pixel art style to Stardew. The amount of work that went into this game, just building all of its personality, characters, and charm alone is worth the price. But it's easily a game that you can get lost in for hours on end. So I want to take another look at Cult of the Lamb. I've had it in one of these lists before, but back then the Switch port, it didn't run the best. Since then, they've added so much extra content for free. Post-game content, you can play in co-op now, new quest lines, new tarot cards, relics, new buildings, new follower traits and quests, so many secrets to discover. The best part is a new performance mode that doubles the FPS and smooths out any issues this game had on the console previously. It was a pun intended cult hit in 2022. The game is split in a two halves. A Hades-esque roguelike action game and an Animal Crossing-esque villager life sim. But it's the way these two halves feed back into each other that makes the game so addicting. While you're out adventuring, you rescue new followers and collect resources so that back in your community, you can build more things and make your followers happier. As you grow your cult, you can hold sermons, lay down new doctorates, and harvest follower devotion to help unlock new weapons and abilities for your adventuring. Constantly looping back into each other and making you want to do both halves of the game over and over and just one more time. The monochromatic art direction is sublime. The character art and expressions are both adorable and terrifying. The music is fantastic and it's just such a fun experience from start to finish. And that was at launch. There's about four or $5 paid DLCs now that'll have just cosmetic stuff. They're fun to have, but not needed. All the actual new DLC is completely free. I find it amazing that in today's day and age, we have all these AAA super rich developers who will nickel and dime us every time they wanna release any sort of new content in a game. But these indie devs, games like this, games like Stardew, are still pumping out these massive expansions for games that released years ago, come completely free just for the fans of the game that want to enjoy more content. It's just incredible. Last time I was in Japan, I saw this game on the shelf. It's called Natsumon and it had just released the week that we were there. Every game store we went into, we saw locals walking around grabbing this game. Sadly, when I got home, I tried to play it and it's all in Japanese. But as of a couple weeks ago, the English translation of this game dropped on the eShop. Turns out that this is somewhat a sequel to a series of games that started in the year 2000 on PlayStation called Boku no Natsu Yasumi, which means my summer vacation. Now this is a full 3D open world type game rather than the hand-drawn locked camera perspective that it had before, but the heart and soul of these games are still here. The heart and soul being a very relaxing day-to-day -day life sim adventure where you play as a young boy on a summer vacation in 1999 doing whatever the heck you want. I mean, you're a kid. It's your summer vacation. You have 31 days in the game and you can catch bugs, meet locals, help them with their problems. Fishing? There's a lot of fishing in the games today. <laughs> there are missions you can pick up, but you don't have to do a single one. The only real goal here you might want to go for is collecting stickers because these act as a stamina bar, which allow you to sprint further and climb higher. But no matter what you do, there's always something to jot down in your notebook diary accompanied by these adorable hand-drawn childlike sketches. Visually, uh, it's a bit of a mixed bag. I can see this being the only thing that might turn away possible new players because the 3D elements are really giving uh Game Freak, which is a shame because the character models are very charming and the interior areas are just gorgeous with a more traditional to the series hand-drawn art style and the same locked camera angles. I wish the whole world had looked similar to these areas, but it's not too bad. This game is so Japan coded. Obviously with its setting, characters, culture, and general vibe, all of which I love, but also it doesn't have English voice acting. And I love that. Not only does it fit the vibe of the game even more, but it helps my continue continued and very slow learning of Nihongo. <laughs> it's just charming, relaxing, 
and Sugoi. To make up for the $40, how about we talk about one that's a dollar? Yeah! You remember back recently when I was ranting about Luigi content on my channel? Well, that same day, Tori's Panic Pack had released on the eShop, and I bought that almost as quickly as I bought all of the sexy ones. I've had Tori games in these lists before, because they're a damn dollar, man. The other games are Tori 2 and Tori 3D. They look and play like old school PS1 era platformers. The controls are very solid. Visually, the bright pinks and neon colors pop. The art style is obviously extremely nostalgic. Have I mentioned that they're a dollar? <laughs> the new Paddock Pack includes a mini adventure version of the other games with three new fast paced levels. Then there's Tori's Jumble Jam 2, which is a set of four new challenging bonus levels. All of this, by the way, in that one dollar, you also get a Tori mission mode that has 24 tight challenge missions in a new futuristic environment that pushes your platforming skills in unique ways and man it is a dollar there's a better than none chance that right now if you go and look at this game and use your gold coins that you get for buying other games on the eShop or physical games you can just get it for free it's free now <laughs> today i'm not ending with the best I'm ending with my favorite. And that's SteamWorld Heist 2, baby. The SteamWorld series has seen a load of success on the Switch since launch, with games like SteamWorld Dig 2 selling more on Switch than Steam, one of my favorite statistics. This series is a fascinating one, as all the games are set in the SteamWorld universe, but expanding different genres. But SteamWorld Heist might just be my favorite. It's a turn-based strategy action adventure with so many nuances and replayability. Your main ship is led by Captain Leeway, and you move around outside of combat as him, but otherwise, you play as whoever you want. Every time you pull up into a new outpost, there'll be a completely new crew for hire, each with their own classes and unique abilities. On my current playthrough, I decided to hire Barbara. Full name, Barbara Crowbar Crow. They're in the flanker class with a double shotgun and a unique high jump ability. You can even equip your crew with items, new weapons, and even cool hats. As you venture out, you find these missions that start the turn-based battling, taking your own unique crew, your weapons and abilities inside and trying to survive, grabbing the loot around the levels, and if you're lucky enough, finding the rare loot too. Each of the class types play out completely differently. From brawler to boomer, engineer, reaper, and flanker, you can and should mix these class types, leveling up one character's class ability tree, then switching that same character to another class and leveling up ability in that tree can lead to some really overpowered super robots. You only get two actions per character each turn, like movement, shooting, or abilities, so that limit of only two actions can make these runs very challenging. Then there's the good part at the end of the missions. It's checking and opening all the loot you get. It's randomized, and looking for those rare drops and legendary weapons or ship parts can get addicting. There's a pretty large overworld map for you to explore in the submarine, and this is a whole nother aspect of the game where you can get into ship battles that become increasingly more difficult so you need to upgrade your ship as you play too and just customizing that can become addicting. The SteamWorld series has a lot of fans and it does really well so I feel confident you'll enjoy this a lot. And that, <laughs> another 10 games on the eShop. I told you, I mean, I really like all of them and they're all so different. You have like a creepy cryptic puzzle murder mystery, twin stick platformer shooter Metroidvania. You have a relaxing summer adventure. There's just so many different things to play and enjoy. And I really did play and enjoy all of them. Obviously at this point, I've reviewed like 350 in these videos alone. So you can go back and you, I'm, there's a game back there that you haven't bought and played yet. I guarantee it. Again, a huge thank you to the sponsor of this video, Opera GX. Make sure to click their links down below. My desk mat is only available for a couple more weeks. So links for that will also be down below. I love you guys a lot. Like, comment, and subscribe and all of that. And I'll see you in the next video that I can't wait. Oh, I can't wait to make.